Donc nous sommes heureux d'accueillir Yvon Corvin. We are proud to welcome you in this Mad Park seminar. Yvon Corvin is a professor at Columbia University and a fellow of the Clay Mathematical Institute. He won many prizes, among them the Rollo Davidson Prize and the Poincaré Cher. That's why he's currently working in the IHP. In fact, this morning he was in New York, and we are very happy uh, he accepted to make uh, an, uh, a talk for undergraduate students. So we hope you'll enjoy it too. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, OK. Either you're hearing me or you're hearing French me. Uh, which probably sounds better than real me. So, oop, something switched. Okay, we're back. Um, all right, so it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to discuss a subject uh, around the idea of universal phenomena in random systems. And the way that I'm going to approach this is through the study of what are called integrable probabilistic systems. It's hard to say that. Um, what they are, these are very special systems uh, which allow for exact computation and whose asymptotic or large scale behavior determines what should be universal behaviors of much larger classes of systems. So as I define them up here, I say that an integral probabilistic system admits many exact and concise formulas for various expectations of observables of interest. I'll give you examples, many examples, throughout this talk. And then the second idea is that using these systems, you're able to understand wide universality classes and the behavior of those classes. Now, the origin of these integrable models, these nice, exactly solvable models, is generally from algebraic structures. And the two structures that will play a role are representation theory and quantum integrable systems. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of how these give rise to the systems I'll discuss. If you're interested, I'll be giving something like five hours of lectures tomorrow about this subject. Okay? So that's an advertisement. Now, once you've found a few special examples of systems who you can really analyze, there's a whole different set of tools, non-algebraic tools, which are needed to show universality, to show that every other system, not just the nice systems, show the same behavior. So I'm going to mainly focus on the examples and not on how to show universality, because generally these are open problems. We don't know how to do most of the universality results that I'll be discussing. Okay? So these are problems for you. Okay, So let's get started with something that we know a lot about. This is the most classical example in probability, and it's the most classical example of an integrable probabilistic system. And that's a coin flip. Now, I don't know what they call it in Europe, is it heads and tails? There is no head and tail on a euro, right? What is it? Peel et face. Peel et face. So I, I used the wrong notation. But head is peel and face is, or the other way around. OK. So yeah, I guess face would be head, right? Um, OK, so coin flipping goes back many, many years. And you can ask the question, if you flip a coin n times, or n coins, uh, how many heads, how many faces will there be? And it's an easy calculation to see that the number of heads equaling h, the probability of that is 2 to the minus n, which is the probability of any configuration, times the number of configurations out of n which have exactly h heads, which is n choose h. Now this is a calculation that goes back quite a ways. And Bernoulli used this exact formula and knowledge around this 
to show the first example of a law of large numbers. So what the law of large numbers says is that if you flip the coin many, many times, not only do you expect to have n over 2 heads, so on average you have that many, but in fact you will converge, when you take the number of heads divided by n, you'll converge to 1 half. In various senses, maybe the probability that you're far away from a half by an epsilon will go to 0 for any epsilon as n goes to infinity. There are other forms as well. Now, that was refined about 20 years later by de Mauve, and then subsequently forgotten for about 80 years, and then reproved by Laplace uh, in what's called the central limit theorem. So what the central limit theorem, or the first example of a central limit theorem, said is that if you look around that limiting behavior, so you know on average you'll have n over 2 heads, but it won't be exactly that amount. And so you can quantify exactly how far away from n over 2 you are. And the answer they showed was that the number of heads differs by n over 2, from n over 2, by something of order square root of n. And if you look at the probability that you're less than n over 2 plus a half square root n times x, then as n goes to infinity, this probability actually converges to the area underneath what's called the bell curve, or the Gaussian distribution. In other words, the integral from minus infinity to x of this density, which is plotted here. So this is the famous uh, bell curve, or Gaussian distribution. And how is this proved? Well, I'm going to give you very little calculations in this talk. There'll be two calculations. They both involve single integrals. This is the first. So the way that this was proved was, unsurprisingly, due to work, earlier work of de Moivre. De Moivre, in fact not Sterling, was the first to prove the approximation for n factorial. Sterling improved. He got this, the, the, the 2 pi factor here. So what, what they showed was that, well, in order to analyze this probability, you express it in terms of factorials. And then the question becomes, how do you take asymptotics of factorials? How do factorials behave for large values? Now, the calculation goes as such. You express n factorial in terms of the Euler gamma function at n plus 1. That has a very simple integral representation, which is given here. Now, there's a change of variables that expresses it. It brings out an n to the n plus 1. And it expresses it now as an integral from 0 to infinity of e to the n, and then a simple function, log z minus z. Now, the idea is that this quantity is going to focus around its critical value, around its largest value. And you can check that log z minus z behaves approximately like negative 1 minus a parabola centered at 1. And so what that means is that this integral is going to be captured by its behavior close to 1, because otherwise it will die out away from there. So what you get is you get a factor of e to the minus n coming from this order 1 term. And then you get a remaining integral from 0 to infinity of e to n times a uh, quadratic term. And so that quadratic integral in is the Gaussian integral. That gives you a factor of square root 2 pi n. And the rest came from the n to the n plus 1 and from the e to the minus n. And this is uh, Sterling's formula. This method is something that's called Laplace's method. And in fact, this type of method will underlie all of the asymptotic results that I'll show you, but just in more complicated ways. So I wanted to show you this. You would get a flavor for the type of calculations that are used. Of course, they end up being a little bit harder than this, but this is the general idea. OK, so to summarize, one shows for this very simple model of coin flipping through some nice exact calculations and asymptotics thereof, the first example of the Gaussian distribution coming up in random variables. Now, we know that that's not where the story ends. That's just where it begins. And it, 
in fact, wasn't for about 200 years that people were really able to extend beyond the exact solvable cases. So maybe you could flip a coin which wasn't 50-50. Maybe with probability p, it was heads, and q, it was tails. OK, that can be done. But it wasn't until Lyapunov, in the turn of the century, that it was shown that this Gaussian distribution, the bell curve, here we are, that the bell curve arises in many contexts. Okay? This is called the central limit theorem, since it really was a very important uh, result in probability. So here is the central limit theorem, or one version of it. If you have a bunch of independent, identically distributed random variables, think of them as coin flips, or rolls of a die, or some complicated machine that gives you a number, a random number. So you get many, many examples of that, and you add them together. Then, well, the law of large numbers tells you that if each individual experiment or each individual random variable has mean m, then the sum should behave like m times n, the number of experiments or the number of variables. And then the central limit theorem tells you that if v is the variance, of one of them, then it will behave like v times square root of n times a random variable which is given by this Gaussian distribution. Or in other words, the formula written, this limit, converges to the integral of this Gaussian density. So this I already showed you one example where that's true, but Lyapunov showed that this is true for any random variable, not just 0, 1, or heads, tails. Okay. Um, there have been lots of work subsequent. In fact, a, a very large area of probability deals with what's called Gaussian processes, which is the study of systems, maybe lots of different random variables that all are related uh, in some sense in terms of this sort of density. Um, this bell curve is, in fact, the basis for all of classical statistics. So whenever people talk about t-tests and p-values, and this is based on the bell curve. Okay? Now, what we will see in the rest of the talk is that the bell curve, though important, doesn't arise everywhere. And there are lots of systems which are interesting which are not described by the bell curve, and not even described by the scaling under which the bell curve arises. So what I'll describe is different types of systems with different scalings and different statistics. Okay. So we're going to extend the bell curve, but a, a, a different type of extension than described here. OK. Before I do that, I want to introduce one of the main subjects of this talk, which is going to be the subject of random growth, randomly growing interfaces. Now, the example I give here is a very simple one. And it is still related to the central limit theorem, to the, to the bell curve. It's called the random deposition model. And the way it works is blocks, like in red, fall independently in each column uh, according to a waiting time, which is what's called exponentially distributed. What that means, well, it's described here, but what it means to be exponentially distributed is that in each instant of time, there is a very small probability the block will fall, proportional to the size of that instance. So in a large amount of time, you expect to see some blocks fall. But uh, it's a memoryless process. So at each instant, it doesn't care what happened before. It's only determined by this present state. So you can think about there as being like a little Geiger counter. And the Geiger counter clicks, and a block falls. And we know that radioactive decay is, in a sense, memoryless. So in any case, here's a uh, picture of the system. So the blocks are falling independently in each column. So each column grows totally independent of every other column. And then it restarts. So 
because each column is independent and each column is just the sum of the times it takes for each block to grow, the law of large numbers and central limit theorem from before kicks in. It's relevant here. And what you find is that each column grows at a deterministic speed. In fact, the speed is like 1 over lambda. And it has fluctuations of square root of the time that you're running it for and Gaussian distribution around that. Yeah. So that's what you're seeing in, in the picture that I, in this simulation. If you were to pause it, you would see that these are distributed as Gaussian around the mean. Okay. But this isn't such an interesting model because if you've ever seen something growing in nature, it's very uncommon that you don't have any spatial correlation. That you don't, that one point is high and the other point is very low. Things tend to be related. They, they smooth themselves out a little. So the question that I'll pose is whether this type of behavior arises in real models. And the first real model I'll discuss is something called ballistic deposition or the sticky block model. Now this is a very simple way to modify the last model I gave so that there is spatial relation, spatial correlation. So the way that it works is that as before, blocks fall independently in each column after exponential waiting times, after independent waiting times, random variable waiting times. The only difference is that a block is sticky. You, it has a little glue on it. And so when it falls, it sticks to the first edge that it comes in contact with. So here it would fall and stick to this edge. Here it just sticks as it would before. And here it sticks to this edge. So immediately you break the independence of columns. If one column is high, it tends to increase the height of the other columns because you get overhangs. So here's a, another simulation. Very different. The sticky block model, first you have these empty cavities. And you also notice that if you look at the kind of envelope at the, at the top of this curve, it's much smoother than the previous example. And it also is seemingly correlated in space, and the fluctuations seem to be smaller. So the question is, what's going on in this model? What's going on? OK. Well, the answer is, we really don't know. We have conjectures. There's numerical evidence. There's good reason to believe. But mathematically, we can prove very little about that simple model. Okay. So let me compare the two models. So here was the model of random deposition, where growth is independent in each column. And there we have linear growth speed. There is an overall speed, which is just equal to the rate at which particles fall. And then around that, we have a CLT with Gaussian fluctuations and square root fluctuations, so t to the 1 half, and no spatial correlation. On the other hand, we have for ballistic deposition a very different behavior, something which I will now describe to you as the KPZ, or kadar prezi zhang universality class. Now, the behavior of the growth speed, you see each of these colors represents a different epoch of time, a different time slice. You see there is linear growth, linear speed. However, we, don't, we can prove that there is a speed. We don't know what that speed is. We know it's bigger than 1 if, if the rate at which blocks fall is 1 because there are these holes. But we don't know if it's 1.4, 2. We don't really know what it is. Now, moreover, we don't know what the fluctuations are. But there's good reason reason that I'll give you over the course of this talk to believe that the fluctuations, let's say, of this upper curve are actually much smaller than they are over here. So here was t to the 1 half. Here the fluctuations, say, above a given point, above 100, the fluctuation in the height is of order t to the 1 third, much smaller. 
and with a very different distribution, something called the GOE tracy widom limit, something I'll describe a little bit later. So you have both different scale and different statistics describing the fluctuations. Moreover, it's believed that the height at one location and the height somewhere distance t to the 2 3rd apart will stay correlated as t is large. In other words, there is a certain length on which what you're seeing is the same. So if you're looking at neighbors, they appear to be roughly the same height. And you need to go pretty far away before the heights change in the t to the 1 3rd scale. Now, where do these conjectures come from? That's the question. How, how can I conjecture this? Well, you could run numerics, but until the last you know, 15 years, numerics computers weren't so good. So people were studying this model a while ago, in the 50s and up, up to the 80s and 90s, and they still had some understanding of what should happen. And the way they understood it was by studying related models which they could compute, which they could prove these types of results about. And these are the integrable models that I'm going to discuss. Okay, so this is a model that we don't understand mathematically. Here's a model that, oh, okay. <laughs> I'll give you a model we do. But before that, I want to show you that this ballistic deposition not model is actually not a very bad model for some real things, real things in nature. Well, I'm not sure if the first thing is actually in nature. Um, it's Tetris. And well, it's, it's a large, large Tetris board. And I imagine in the audience there is somebody or a few people who are very good at programming. So here is a suggestion of something for you to do. Make a gigantic Tetris game. And then let the pieces fall randomly. So let, they, let them fall in their random orientation and random location. And then look and see how the thing grows. And I bet that it's going to look something like, like this. It won't, it won't be exactly the same, but I bet that if you compare the prediction that I gave for this model to what you see for the Tetris game, you're going to see similar types of behavior. Okay, so random Tetris is modeled by ballistic deposition. Now here's something which is not uh, a computer game. This is something real. This is actually, I'll show you a video. This is somebody's windshield. And it's uh, freezing rain. And the rain. Well, the freezing rain comes, it hits the windshield, and it falls due to gravity. And it kind of touches, and it, anywhere it touches, because it's cold, it, it, it joins onto the cluster. And what you're seeing looks surprisingly similar to the ballistic deposition model I was describing. Now, unfortunately, if you keep watching the video, a windshield wiper comes and wipes it out at some point, which I don't remember where. So you, you don't get to really see the, oh, here. Mm. OK, maybe not. Somewhere in the video, they, they destroy it. So the statistics are not, are not so good. But this is the general idea. So that's another example uh, of ballistic deposition or random growth in nature. There's one more that I wanted to give, which is a, an experiment you can do tomorrow morning. Take a cup of coffee. Uh, don't, don't go somewhere where you like the waitress or waiter. Then spill it out. Okay? Now what will happen is you will get a coffee ring that forms. Coffee rings are very interesting. What happens is there is an inner boundary to the coffee ring. You have little particles of coffee grinds that collect as it dries out. And they collect on the inner boundary and they form a random interface, which you can see as this dark section. Now, there was a group of experimentalists who made, it wasn't real coffee, but it was some sort of 
idealized coffee with little particles. And they did this many times, and they studied the behavior of this inner interface. And they observed that as long as the coffee molecules weren't perfect spheres, as long as they were a little elongated, you see the same exact behavior that you see here, here, and in the previous model here. The same type of scaling behavior, this t to the one third and t to the two third arose in that situation as well. Okay, one last example, and then I'll give you some, uh, some, some exactly solvable models, some, some hard mathematics. Uh, this is an example of a dis, uh, disordered liquid crystal. So you have a liquid crystal. I'll show you a video in a moment. And what you do is it has two states. There is a more stable state, which is the dark black. And there is a less stable state, which is the gray. Now you start the, the situation where, let's see. You start yourself off in the less stable state. And then you take a laser and you shoot it with the laser, much like I did. And what it does is it causes the system to become more stable. It brings it into its stable form. And since it's stable, it starts to invade the unstable region. And you see a growing cluster. So I'll do it once more. Now, the natural question, who knows how it grows? We don't understand the microscopic nature of it. But you can still study it statistically. You can do this many times, repeat and repeat and repeat the experiment, and study the behavior of the system. So what you see is that if you, here, here you see over time, the colors represent time, and you look in one direction and you ask how much, as I repeat the experiment over and over again, how much does the distance that this ray goes fluctuate? And you can then scale it by the correct exponent, which was the t to the 1 third I was discussing, and you can plot the distribution function uh, the empirical distribution function. And it turns out that you get a different result as far as the distribution function if you start from a point versus from a flat interface. So here's one other example. Here you, you use a lens so that your laser shoots an entire line simultaneously and then you watch that line grow. So this is actually more similar to ballistic deposition because it's growth from a flat surface. Yeah. So the conjecture would have that for the flat situation, you have a certain distribution. And for the curved situation, you have a different, uh, a different distribution, which I'll discuss. And so this is all borne out in experiments. OK. So enough of the physics. I want to describe some math. Now, the way that we understand these types of systems and the way that we start to make predictions about the behavior of these systems is through studying very simple examples. Now, I've already discussed ballistic deposition, which was a very simple example, which just happened to be too hard to solve. This is an example which comes from certain structure, certain algebraic structure, and that makes it easier to solve. Okay? So I'm not going to explain why this is solvable, but I'm going to explain the results that one can prove. So this is a model, which I'll discuss uh, at, with, in some depth. And it's called the corner growth model. And this is going to be our first integrable or exactly solvable example of a randomly growing interface. Okay, all of the other models, these were just too hard to analyze. The way that this system works is, is very simple. You start out with an empty corner, just a, a wedge, absolute value of x. And then everywhere that there is a local minimum, initially there's only one local minimum, which is right at the bottom. But everywhere that there is a local minimum, you can fill it in with a box or invert it, turn it into a local maximum. So here I've already filled in four boxes. And there remain, so here's one local minimum, here's another, and here's a third. So each one of these local minimums can grow or can have a box added to it. 
And the rate at which this occurs is at rate one, according to an exponentially distributed random variable. So it's random little Geiger counter clicks for each location, and it grows. So the time at, for this to grow is exponentially distributed with rate one. And independently, the time at, for this to grow is exponentially distributed with rate one, and so on. Now, the natural thing to do is to start the system empty and let it grow and see what happens. Now, if you do that, I'll give you one more video. So here's the corner. There's a little bit of growth in the bottom. And now I start it growing. And what oh, the resolution is not spectacular. But what you're seeing in the blue curve is the actual interface. And the red curve is representing essentially the law of large numbers, or the general shape of this interface. So even though the growth is totally independent, each box grows independently of every other box, because of the spatial relation, it develops a very simple and very pretty behavior. Now the behavior at the law of large numbers level, if you look at it for a moment, seems to be just given by a parabola. The red curve or the blue curve approximates a parabola. So in fact, you can prove, you can prove, and this was first proved in 1981 by Roast, is that if you look at the height function, so the height function measures how high this interface is above a location x at time t. So initially, the height function at time 0 is absolute value of x. Okay? Absolute value of x looks like this. And then you run the system for a long time t. And then you look in a scale horizontally which is proportional to t times a value x. So I'm really looking, I'm zooming out both in time and in space horizontally. And then what I get is that the height function will have grown proportional to t, such that if I divide by t, then this will have a limit. And what happens is inside absolute value less than x, the limit is curved. It's a parabola given by 1 minus x squared over 2. And outside, the growth hasn't reached outside of that absolute value of x less than 1 region. And you just have the, you just have the initial condition, which is absolute value of x. So you have this sort of, if you think about this, you could think of it as some sort of melting away of a corner or a growing interface here. And this gives you the behavior at the level of the law of large numbers. Now, proving this is harder than proving the law of large numbers for sums of IID random variables. But it can be done. It requires some, some work. But what's a more uh, difficult question is to understand what the fluctuations of the blue curve are around the red curve. Now, already you might have some intuition from our discussion as to what this should be. And this, in fact, is where the intuition came from, where these uh, predictions I, I described, where a lot of them come from. So the result is the following. This was proved in 1999. What you can do is you can do a rescaling to the entire growth process. What I mean is that you introduce a parameter, L, L for large. Okay. And now you look at the system at time proportional to LT. So you think of T as just a, a, a small number, 7, 2, pi. L is a large number, a million. And now you run it for time LT. Now I'm interested in the behavior after that long time LT of this blue curve. And the question is, where will that blue curve live? How much does it fluctuate? And how correlated is it horizontally? And what you can observe and what can be proved is that the curve fluctuates in a window of size L to the one third power. This was the same T to the one third I mentioned, this special one third power. 
much smaller than you would get for the usual Gaussian behavior, which is one half exponent. So what you should do is you should look at the height, and then you also need to ask on what spatial scale, horizontally, do you get decorrelation of the blue curve. So here it's very high, and then it gets low. So what's the scale on which that transition occurs? And it turns out you can show that it's of order L to the 2 3rd. So the correct thing to do is to look at the height function at time LT, spatially scaled by L to the 2 3rd x. You need to subtract off the overall height change. And the overall height change is given by the law of large numbers to be L, o L times t over 2. That's the behavior if you plug in x equals 0, you get 1 half. So it should be t over 2. Now, once you've subtracted that off, you're centered. You're in this little box. And the question is, what do you see? Well, you, again, as I said, you need to scale by L to the 1 3rd here as well. Actually, that should be minus, L to the minus 1 3rd. That's a typo. Now, I call this whole renormalized growth process HLTX. And what was proved in 1999 by Kurt Johansson was that if I look at a single time t at a single location, say x equals 0, then the, the distribution of that fluctuating interface converges to something called the tracy Widom GUE distribution. Some very non-trivial distribution, not Gaussian, which arises in this type of random growth, and which also arise in the experimental systems I described to you uh, as well. OK, so this is a hard result to prove. I won't go into how to prove it. If you're interested, come tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon in particular. OK, now the, I'll tell you just a little bit about this distribution, this Tracy Widom GUE distribution. You should think of this as a modern day bell curve, because it comes up all over the place now. And we're only starting to understand why. Now, it's a little bit harder to write down than the bell curve. Right? The bell curve is given by e to the minus x squared over 2. Okay? This is harder. Of course, here's the probability distribution or density function. It looks a lot like the bell curve if you just, everything looks like the bell curve. Okay? Everything that has one hump and goes to zero looks like a bell curve. But it's not. Uh, it has a negative mean. It's centered to the, to the left of the origin. You can see that in the experiment. You see how the blue curve generally sits above the red curve. Well, there's a minus sign here. So that corresponds to the fact that the mean of this GUE distribution is negative. So you're seeing that in the experiment. The other important factor is that the tail behavior, the way that the probability decays in the negative and in the positive direction is very different. So here is a plot of the logarithm of the probability density function. And on one side, it decays very rapidly. In fact, like e to the minus a constant y cubed. That's this left side. And on the right side, it decays like e to a constant y to the 3 halves. So very different behavior on the two sides. Um, the way to define it is in terms of an infinite series of integrals of determinants. The determinants themselves are written as integrals of the area function. And if you think that's bad, well, then you're probably right. But it's not hard to put this on a computer. In fact, this is a very, very quickly convergent summation. And you can approximate this by something like a 6 by 6 determinant and get a very good plot of this formula, of this distribution. So there are very good numerics for how to deal with these types of objects, these what are called Fredholm determinants. And in fact, these Fredholm determinants, these are the infinite dimensional analogs of regular determinants, and they come up all over the place. So it's not such a bad thing in, when you get used to it. Okay. So this is how this distribution is defined. Not as natural as the uh, 
central limit theorem as the, the uh, Gaussian distribution. Now, the idea uh, behind this result that I gave you, so I explained one result which, ex which showed how a certain growth model behaves as time goes to infinity under this special scaling, this one-third, two-third scaling of uh, fluctuations and space. Now, this is actually an example of behavior which is called the one plus one dimensional Kadar Parisi Zhang universality class, or KPZ universality class. And that's what I want to explain to you right now. What is that class and what is the behavior of that class? So this is supposed to arise in the context of random, grow random growth processes. I've discussed some. In fact, the entire growth process so here I only looked at a one point marginal. I only looked at a single time and a single spatial location. But the entire process as a function of time and space is supposed to renormalize, is supposed to rescale as L goes to infinity to a universal limit whose marginal is what is written here. Now that limit is conjecturally called the KPZ fixed point. The important point about this universality class, however, is what's in red. What's in red says that every model in this class, every random growth process with certain characteristics, which are listed below, should, under the exact same scaling, once you center it by its overall growth speed, behave in the exact same way. So the microscopic behavior, the microscopic rules, don't matter when you scale out. They matter up to certain very small scalings, up to constant scaling, in the same way that the mean and the variance in the usual central limit theorem matters up to scaling. But besides that, you are supposed to see universal behavior when you scale time space and fluctuations with exponents which have a ratio of 3 to 1. Now what do I mean by 3 to 1? Uh, it's very easy to remember. 3 to 1. Time, space, fluctuation. What I mean is here I looked at a time scale which was like L. Or in other words, L to the 3 thirds. And a space scale which was like L to the 2 thirds. And a, time, and a fluctuation, a vertical fluctuation scale, which was like L to the one-third. So in other words, I have my 3, 2, 1 time, space, fluctuation scale. And so if you look at any of these models, for instance, if you look back at one of my uh, other growth processes, so here's a growth process, I can apply the same principle. I look at a time, I, I run this for a long time, and I look at a spatial, a radial direction of order time to the two-third and a vertical or a, a I, I look at the direction along a radius of order t to the one-third and what I'm supposed to see when I center by this overall growth speed is the same behavior as for the model I was just describing. That's the conjecture and that's what the experiments show. Now, when is this supposed to come up? Well, I'll give you kind of a very soft explanation for when it's supposed to come up. It's not a, a mathematically well-posed conjecture that I'm giving here. There are well-posed conjectures to be made. But the general belief is that this type of behavior and the associated statistics that come with it are supposed to arise when you're dealing with interfaces that are growing in time that have one dimensional interfaces like the plot of a curve which grow according to local dynamics so the growth at one location should only depend on its neighbors or its neighbors neighbors it shouldn't look too far away okay it should be local it should have some sort of smoothing mechanism something which tends to smooth out big valleys or big big hills. You saw that in ballistic deposition. 
right? If you had a big valley, a block would fall and it would just stick and it would fill the entire valley below it. It should have some sort of slope dependent growth rate. Now, what do I mean by that? I can illustrate this on the board. If I look back at my, I had two models I discussed. One was ballistic deposition. Imagine that I have ballistic deposition and I have a very high slope and a box falls. It will stick and the vertical growth will be proportional to the slope. Whereas if I had a very flat instance of ballistic deposition and a block falls, there is no slope. So the increase in the vertical direction is just by one. So the higher the slope, the faster it grows. In fact, the opposite is true for the other model, for corner growth. So if I have corner growth, that's not very good. If I have corner growth and I have a situation where I have something which has essentially zero slope, then boxes can grow very quickly. There's lots of little places for them to grow. On the other hand, if I'm in a region which has high slope, close to one, there's nowhere to latch on. There's nowhere to grow, so the slope, the speed goes to zero. So you see a nonlinear relationship between the local slope and the vertical growth speed. And that's very important. That's a key. Actually, more important than smoothing. And finally, you need some sort of randomness, which is more or less uncorrelated in time and space. So the boxes grow randomly, the boxes fall randomly, something like that. And then, if you have that, it, you should see the same behavior of these systems I've been describing. Now, a nice surprise is that it is possible to relate randomly growing interfaces to lots of other types of systems that you might not expect are related to them. Things that I'll explain in the, in the second part of this talk. And because of these simple relations between a few models of random growth and a few models of lots of other phenomena, it turns out that this KPZ universality class behavior actually arises in many different contexts, not just random growth. So here is a little picture of some of the different contexts in which KPZ universality class behavior arises. The um, context I've been talking about for this first half of the talk is randomly growing interfaces. And I explained to you various examples of models that show the same limiting behavior. And I gave you one model, the corner growth model, which is exactly solvable, for which people can really prove this and compute the behavior, compute the limiting behavior of the system. Now, it turns out that these models of random interface growth are related to various other things. For instance, I'll describe to you how it's related to something called, or certain stochastic partial differential equations. I'll be brief there, because it takes a little bit to define a stochastic partial differential equation. It actually takes a little bit of time to even say that. So I, I won't talk very much about that. Um, I will talk a little bit more about traffic, because clearly everyone has experienced traffic here in Paris, uh, also in New York. Um, I'll also describe another classical problem, a problem that I always thought about when I would walk around the streets of New York, which is how to get from point A to point B the fastest when, when you're trying to deal with stoplights or you're trying to you know, optimize a trajectory in a somewhat random environment. Because you don't know where the stoplights are going to be pointing you in one direction or the other. Uh, I'll also then discuss in the end uh, relation to the study of big data. Uh, I believe that in a month there's a special uh, event about big data here. I'll discuss very briefly a connection to big data and random matrices. And finally, I'll, I'll end with a few pictures of random tilings and tell you how these are related to this whole story. But I'll, I'll mainly focus on, on these first three, this interface growth, as I said, 
traffic flow and optimal paths. Now, for all of these models, if you apply, so they, they all generally have a natural time space fluctuation element to them. And the claim is, is that if you apply the same 3, 2, 1 scaling to traffic, and I'll tell you what that means, or to optimal paths, then you should see the same limiting behavior. And we can show that in a few special examples, but then we can generalize and we can try to make conjectures. OK. So um, I'll give you one more example of random interface growth just to show you that it's not just corner growth that we can solve. There are other models. Actually, the model I'll give you is just corner growth, but with one additional factor, which is that there can also be corner death. So it's corner growth and death. What happens is, as before, Whenever you have a local minimum, a local minimum, a valley, it can be filled in with a box. And that happens after some exponential waiting time, random waiting time of rate p. Now simultaneously and independently, every time that there's a local maximum, so here's a local maximum and here's a local maximum, every time that there's a block which can be removed without creating some sort of toppling of other boxes. That happens, the erosion of blocks occur at a different rate, exponential rate p, or, or rate q. Um, now in order to make this interesting, I should allow there to be more growth than death. Because if there's more death than growth, I'll basically end up with an empty corner. And a few small blocks will grow and then die and then grow and then die. But if there's still more growth than death, it will still tend to grow, and I'll see something interesting. Now, you can ask, a very natural question is, well, when p is 1 and q is 0, I told you what happens. How does changing p and q change the system? Does it totally change it, or is it just a very minor tweak? And the answer is that, and this was proved only recently by Tracy and Whittem, at the level of uh, the fluctuation or the central limit theorem, that everything is the same if you only speed up time by dividing through by the asymmetry. In other words, when there is growth and death, the overall growth speed will be given by p minus q. So in order to see the same picture, you need to speed up time by dividing by p minus q. And the answer is that once you've done that, you see the exact same thing as in the totally asymmetric, the only growth situation. So this is a very simple example of universality being proved. It, this model is still exactly solvable. It's still integrable. So this was proved through exact calculation. Now, th there is one small caveat that should be made which is that, as you remember, you're not allowed to divide by 0. So this result cannot be true when p is equal to q. Can't divide by 0. There's a more profound reason why it can't be true, which is that when p is equal to q and you have equal growth and death, you actually are in a different universality class. You have radically different behavior at that one point. What happens? at that one point is that the 3 to 1 scaling becomes 4 to 1 scaling. So time is like t. Spatially, you look like t to the 1 half, and the fluctuations become of order t to the 1 quarter, even smaller. So you could put this into a computer. You could simulate it, and you would see much smaller scale fluctuations arising in this model. So this so-called Edwards-Wilkinson universality class arises in these sorts of very balanced situations, essentially situations where there is equal growth and death in some sense. So, OK, so that's what I wanted to say about random interface growth. I'm going to now move on to the other related systems. Uh, this, this one will, will, will perhaps be slightly scary. It's stochastic partial differential equations. It takes some work to make sense of these. But in fact, 
the way that these, this 3, 2, 1 scaling came and the origin of these three letters, KPZ, Kadar, Prezi, Zhang, came from the study of this equation, this stochastic partial differential equation. Now what happened, and I'll tell you the history of it, because that's perhaps more understandable than the, the math of it. What happened was that in the mid 80s, people were interested in random growth within the physics community. But they didn't know how to do anything. They didn't have any examples that they could analyze. We do now, but they didn't. So what they did is they said, well, what is the simplest continuous or continuum growth model that is around that has the three properties I was interested in? So it should, well, the four properties. So it should have local growth. So here I have a random interface which grows at an instant according to a smoothing mechanism. So in the continuum, what, what is the smoothing mechanism? The Laplacian is the smoothing mechanism. So you have a Laplacian. And then you have a nonlinear dependence on slope. And in the continuum, what's the most simple, what's the simplest nonlinear dependence on slope? Well, it's the square of the gradient or the square of the slope. So they said, let's, let's put that in too. And then they said it should be random. So let's, let's put that in too. Actually, this is a typo. This H should not be there. Just get rid of the H. That's not there. So you just have some random noise. And that's what's called space-time white noise. And this is essentially the derivation of this equation. And they said, now this equation, its long time behavior should be the same as the long time behavior of all of these other models we were interested in. Ballistic deposition, these other models. And so they, they in fact were able to appeal to a, a certain black box, something called dynamical renormalization group. This is a very non-rigorous method, which if you ask physicists, they may or may not understand or agree with. But it gave a prediction, in fact, going back even earlier, and it gave the 3, 2, 1 prediction. Um, they didn't actually have any prediction about the statistics, about the distribution, this analog of the bell curve. And that really didn't come until 1999 when the mathematicians took up the, the mantle, when, when the mathematicians started dealing with this. Now part of the whole problem is that even making sense of this equation mathematically is hard. That didn't happen until the mid-90s. Bertini and Cancrini, Bertini and Giacomin, even understanding what it means to solve this equation is difficult. Now, here's, so the physicists made this prediction of the 3, 2, 1 scaling. So this would be the claim that the KPZ equation, this equation is in the KPZ universality class. So you can ask, if you're a mathematician, is the KPZ equation in the KPZ universality class? And of course it sounds like it should be, but we have a very strict definition for what it means to be in the KPC universality class, which is to actually prove the 3, 2, 1 scaling and to actually prove the correct distribution. And that didn't happen until about five years ago um, in, in some works here as well as some, some non-rigorous work in the physics uh, literature. Okay, so the, the picture that one gets in, in the end is that the KPZ equation actually is a transition between this Edwards-Wilkinson and this KPZ universality class. And as you take time to be short, you get to the Edwards-Wilkinson class. As you take time to be large, you get to the KPZ class. So in a sense, the KPZ equation focuses in on the transition between zero asymmetry and positive asymmetry. And so, in fact, you can find the KPZ equation arising from microscopic growth models, like the corner growth model, when you tune the asymmetry, P minus Q, to zero in a critical way. I'm not going to go into depth on how that works, but I'd be happy to discuss this later. But the point is, is that the KPZ equation itself has some amount of universality. This is, of course, the more important universality, the 3, 2, 1 but there is universality to this continuum object itself. Okay, so that was 
complicated. Got a little complicated here. We're going to take a step back and, and do very easy stuff for the rest of the talk. Okay. We're going to talk about traffic now. This is always a, a bone of contention. When you're driving, uh, you want to know how long it's going to take to get home. Okay. So you can introduce various traffic models that give you predictions for that behavior. Now the first model is, is a horrible traffic model. Um, it wasn't introduced as a traffic model. It was introduced in the biology literature, in fact. There's a model for uh, the way that RNA transcriptor molecules move along a, a uh, RNA sequence. And what happens is you, you imagine that each particle is moving left and right with some probability or some, at some exponential rate waiting time, left Q, right P. And they, of course, can't cross each other because they're on the same strand of, of, of RNA. So these things move around on the RNA, and they want to do something, but they move randomly. And you, you want to ask, how do they move? How does the system evolve? In fact, so here the particles jump left and right with rate Q and P. The only rule is, is that you can't jump onto a site that's occupied. So these jumps are both ruled out. However, this particle could jump to the right. This model, this traffic model, can be exactly related to the corner growth model with growth and death. The way that it works is that you have your corner growth model. Now, when a particle jumps left, it corresponds to uh, filling in a, a local minimum. Because it can only jump left when there's a hole and then a particle. So, you have local minimums turn into local maximums when a particle jumps left. And when it jumps right, the opposite happens. Actually, this picture is, uh, am I doing that right? OK, yeah, that's, that's correct. So actually, what I, no, what I said is opposite. What I said is opposite. So here's the, here's the relationship. You have your height function. The height function is composed of a collection of negative one slope increments and positive one sloped increments. To every negative one sloped increment, you associate a particle. And to every positive one slope increment, you associate an empty spot or a hole. Now, when, when, a, a, when a minimum is turned into a maximum, it corresponds to moving the minus one to the right by one. And likewise, when a maximum turns into a minimum, it corresponds to moving the minus one to the left by one. And that's exactly the behavior of these particles. Yeah, so the, it's basically given by the derivative of this height function. Yeah. So everything I said about corner growth holds true for this particle system as well. For instance, if you look at the number of particles that cross the origin, that will exactly correspond to the height above the origin. Right? You keep track of the number of particles that have crossed the origin. That will give you the height above the origin. So all of my results from before apply to this simple model of growth. OK, let me give you two other models, which are perhaps more realistic models of, of uh, traffic on a road. So when you're driving, you tend to slow down uh, as you approach the next car. You keep a little buffer. Well, some people don't. Um, Here's a model. Actually, it was only introduced a few years ago by Borden and myself. It's called QTASAP. It's a very simple model. Particles jump to the right at a rate, according to an exponential waiting time, a randomly distributed random variable waiting time, whose rate is given by 1 minus Q to the gap. Q is a number between 0 and 1. I'll tell you what it means in a moment. But the gap tells you the distance to the next particle. So what happens is that as the gap goes to 0, the rate goes to 0, because you get 1 minus q to the 0, or that approaches 1. And as the gap goes to infinity, since q is less than 1, the rate goes to 1. So that's like driving on an open road. When you don't see anyone, you drive at rate 1. And as you approach the guy in front of you, you start to slow down. Now, the value of Q determines how crazy a driver is. 
When Q is very close to 1, it requires a very large gap before Q to the gap gets small. Or in other words, before 1 minus Q to the gap gets reasonably, gets reasonable. So was a Q close to 1 driver is very cautious. If Q goes to 0, then you get a crazy driver who only hits the brakes right before he's going to hit the car in front of him. Okay? He still does stop. But, so you can ask the effect of this braking in, in, or the effect of this safety gap in, in the model. Now, in fact, we know that when we drive, so this is one model, which is exactly solvable. I'll describe results in a moment for this. We also know that when you drive, you sometimes hit the brakes. And if you hit the brakes, the guy behind you sometimes hits the brakes, and so on and so forth. You see the red lights in front, you tap the brakes, and so on, and it propagates backward. So here's a very simple model that includes both the safety mechanism, the gap mechanism, and braking. So what happens is you still jump to the right at rate 1 minus q to the gap. However, every once in a while, let's say at rate 1, you jump to the left. Now, cars don't actually move backwards when they hit the brake. But in a moving frame, they do. So if you imagine putting yourself in a moving frame, then hitting the brake is like equivalent to jumping backwards. Now, when you jump backwards, who knows why you did it? Maybe you saw a rabbit. You looked. And then you realized you weren't looking at the road, and you hit the brakes. When you jump backwards, the guy behind you sees, all he sees is the red lights, the brake lights. And so depending on the distance, he might brake as well. Now, the larger the distance, the less likely he is to brake. So you let the probability that the next guy breaks be like Q to the gap a gap between him and you. Now if he breaks, he propagates it backwards. And the next guy breaks with the same type of probability, and so on and so forth, until the, the red light breaking dies out. Yeah. So this is a reasonable model. Now what you can show, and what we've shown, is that in both of these models, you have KPZ class behavior. Now how does it manifest itself? Well, the relation is that. Let's say you start with step initial data. So step initial data is what corresponds to wedge initial data in this picture. Okay, so wedge is, is all minus 1 and then all plus 1. So in other words, all particles to the left of the origin and empty to the right. It's like a massive traffic jam that just opens up. Okay, so the light turns green and the particles start to spread out according to these rules or these rules. Now, the thing that corresponds to the height function is the number of particles to have crossed the origin or, or a given, uh, given vector. So if you study the number of particles to cross the origin, you put a toll booth at the origin, then what we can show is that as time grows, as time is large, the number of particles will grow like some constant, depending on the model, can be computed, times t, plus another model-dependent constant, times t to the one-third, times a random variable, which in the limit as t grows to infinity is described by this tracy Whittem GUE distribution, the same ubiquitous modern-day bell curve. Okay. So, in other words, if you need to tell somebody how long it's going to take for you to get home, and you're very far in the back of this collection of cars, what you can tell them is that I'll be home in CT amount of time, plus a random fluctuation of order t to the one third with certain distribution. Now that's good, because normally if you just thought about it, you would say, well, I'll be there in order t to the one half fluctuation. So you can give more certainty than the Gaussian type of behavior would suggest. And this is actually useful. OK. That was random. That was traffic. That was one thing. Now I want to talk about uh, another class of systems that arise uh, for which this KPZ behavior arises as well. And this will bring me from cars to people. OK? Because we don't always drive in cities. We sometimes walk in cities. And I want to describe uh, two examples of, of uh, 
problems involving optimizing your walking trajectory. So the first model is something called last passage percolation. Um, and it's, it's actually, it's just the same corner growth model, the original where you only grow, corner growth model, uh, just in a different guise, in a different, uh, different way of interpreting it. Okay, so this is a connection to the earlier stuff. How does it work? Well, how did the corner growth model work? What happened was that every time you had a local minimum, so here blue, dark blue is my interface. Everywhere you had a local minimum, you could grow a box after an exponentially distributed waiting time. But you might as well just say that that waiting time, let's give it a name. So let's say that we grow box 32 after time w32. And w32 will be a distributed as an exponential random variable. So in fact, we can write down all of the w's, wij, will tell you how long it takes to grow box ij once its parents are there, once, it, once there's a valley around ij. Okay? So these are all independent exponential random variables. Now, an equivalent question to studying the height function is to study how long it takes for box xy to grow from, from time 0. So I take a box xy somewhere up here, and I say, how long until this blue invades box xy? If I know how long it takes to grow box xy, I know how long it is until the height function reaches xy. So it's equivalent. Now, this lxy satisfies a very simple recursion relation, something that's called linear programming in, in some guys. This recursion says that, well, how long is it until this box grows? My parents need to grow. I have two parents, so lx minus 1y and lxy minus 1. They both need to be there. So I need to wait until the maximum of those two growth times. Plus, I need to wait till I grow, which is given by wxy. So this is a recursion that this random variable, that this function satisfies. Of course, you can repeat the recursion. You can in you can repeat that this can be expressed in terms of his parents. And this one can be in terms of its parents. And what you get by recursing is that the time it takes for a given box to grow, LXY, is given by the maximum over all trajectories, which involve only up left and up right steps. Of the sum, so trajectories from position 1, 1 to position x, y of the sum of the weights of these w, i, j's along that path. Okay? So I keep repeating the recursion, and I get this formula out of it. So here, there are three possible trajectories that only go up left and up right. There's this one. There's one that goes like this, a little zigzag. And then there's the reflection, this one, that goes on the right side. So I, each one of those, I take a sum of the weights. So here I sum up this number, this number, this number, and this number. I take the sum of those weights, and then I compare those three sums of weights, and I take the biggest. Now, of course, each sum can use the same sets of weights. So I'm comparing correlated random variables. So it's not so easy. But this gives me a way to express LXY. Now, because of the relation to corner growth, because I know how corner growth grows, I get the KPZ class behavior for this system. In particular, if I look in some direction, x, y, and then I take t, so I look at l, t, uh, l, x, t, y, t, so I go far out, I go distance t in that direction, then it will behave again like some constant t plus another constant t to the one-third times a random variable, which we're very familiar with at this point. 
this Tracy Whittem GUE distribution. As far as uh, thinking about this as, as a pedestrian walking in a city, rotate the picture just a little bit by 45 degrees. Now you're walking on a grid. And imagine these W's are pots of gold. And they're random pots of gold. And you need to go from home to, to school. You need to go efficiently, but you want to pick up as much gold as you can. And that's what this question is answering. How does, as you go very far, how does the amount of gold you can get behave? OK. Here's a uh, slightly less contrived uh, model for walking in a city. Um, this is a, a rather recent work with uh, a student here in Paris, Guillaume Barracan and myself. Um, so we introduced a model for uh, walking in a city with, with uh, stoplights, with, with uh, pedestrian signals. So when you walk in, in the city, you come to a road. And let's say that you want to start here and you want to end here. So here's New York City. This is downtown Manhattan. There are other places that are grids, but this is the one I'm most familiar with. Um, let's say I want to go from this bottom corner to this top right corner. And I want to go there fast, as fast as possible. But whenever I get to an intersection, I need to wait for the stoplight. Well, only in one direction. Because there's always one direction you can cross, and there's one direction you need to wait. So a, a simple model for how that behaves is that at every vertex, you have two outgoing edges. And I'll associate the edge, the amount of time I need to wait to go in that direction. So naturally, uh, one of the edges will have zero waiting time. Because after all, the light allows me to cross in that direction. And the other edge will have a random waiting time, which I might as well take to be exponentially distributed, because that's everything I've been talking about so far. Now, which one is which is random. So you flip a coin, and you open up one of the edges. You say, you can freely go up, but to go right, you need to pay a certain time penalty. And now the question is, in that environment, what's the fastest route from the bottom left to the top right? This is the type of thing Google should tell you if Google knows all the stoplights. But it doesn't, so Google will give you some guess. Now, if you go in a diagonal direction, then more or less the right thing to do is to just follow the path of all zeros. Because the path of all zeros will roughly bring you in a diagonal direction. However, if you wanted to go at slope 30 degrees, some other direction, then you need to pay a price sometimes. You need to sometimes wait. And the question is, where do you wait? And how do you wait? And how does that affect the behavior? And so what we can show is that if you look at any direction which is not diagonal, and you look at the time it takes to go distance horizontally, uh, xt, and vertically yt, and you take t to be large, probably larger than New York, probably larger than any city. But anyway, it's, it's math. We can do this. Then you find that there is a constant times t, depending on x and y, of course, the constants. And then t to the 1 third in the GUE distribution. So you can exactly quantify this. And this, of course, could be of some use if you want to design a strategy and you want to benchmark the optimal strategy. You want to compare your strategy to the optimal. So here is a, a simple example of how that works. OK. How are we on time? I'll give you one more example, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kind of uh, be brief on, on what remains. Because I don't, uh, you know, there, there are so many examples. Here is a, something that seems rather different. It, it, it has a similar flavor, but it's a slightly different thing. Imagine now. You still have a grid, and you still have a walk. You still have a random walk on the grid. Imagine now that rather than having the red curve be a random walk, where you jump left or right with probability a half, imagine that at every 
time-space point. So I think of time in the vertical and space in the horizontal. At every time-space point here, I choose a random variable, uniform 0, 1, random variable. And with that probability, I make my walker go left. And with the opposite probability, I make the walker go right. Now, so a random walk follows this random environment. And it, and it ends up somebody, somewhere. Now, the question that I'm going to be interested in, and there are many questions to ask, but the natural question is, what if, rather than just having a single random walk, well, if I have a single random walk, and I zoom out, that random walk will converge to a Brownian motion, just like in the case of 1 half, 1 half, usual random walk. However, if I put more than one random walker in the same environment, they start to see the same environment, and I start to feel the effect of the environment. In particular, if I put an exponential number of random walkers, so I take n, n random walkers in the same environment, and I look at the maximum at time t of those n random walkers, and I take n to be like e to a, a constant, say r t. So many random walkers in the same random environment. And I ask, where, where, are, where are they? How far to the right can they go? Then it turns out that this exactly behaves like this KPZ universality class. Totally, totally surprising in some sense. It's like you, you have this random environment, and you just pump a bunch of small particles in. You let them bounce around. And you look at the edge. And the edge of that random cluster of particles is exactly described by KPC behavior, KPC universality class behavior. Now this should be compared to what happens in the deterministic case. If, the, if there is no randomness, if you jump left with probability a half and right with probability a half, and you put in an exponential number of random walkers, they're all independent. And so you can use what's called large deviation and extreme value theory to understand the behavior of the, the furthest particle. And it's very different. It's of order 1, not of order t to the 1 third. And it's given by what's called the Gumbel distribution. So you get radically different behavior at the, of the, at the edge of this system. And in fact, the edge is radically different. The constant that you see uh, here and here are going to be different. Okay. Let me, in, in the time that remains, uh, be rather brief and tell you about big data and then end with a very pretty picture of tilings. The uh, connections between this and KPZ are there, but they're a little bit harder to see. So I'll just tell you uh, results uh, about this. Now, in fact, throughout the entire talk, I've been referring to something called the Tracy Widom GUE distribution. And I never bothered to tell you what GUE stood for. It wasn't just GUI. It, it actually stands for something. Now what it stands for is the Gaussian unitary ensemble. And this is the first instance in which this distribution arose. So what is this? It seems very different than what I've been talking about. Um, the GUE ensemble is a measure on n by n matrices. So you take, you can have random variables, you know, random real numbers, but you can also have random matrices in which the entries are chosen randomly. Now the simplest way of choosing a random matrix, which is going to have real eigenvalues, is to just choose every entry random subject to symmetry, either Hermitian symmetry or, or real symmetry. So here I'm dealing with Hermitian symmetry. So I choose an n by n matrix whose entries are equal up to complex conjugation across the diagonal and otherwise are random. And as we're used to, the simplest random variable is a Gaussian. So I choose my diagonal entries to be normal Gaussian random variables and my off diagonal to be complex Gaussian random variables. OK, maybe this is a little complicated. But in fact, it's a very simple model. It's a model that was introduced 
in nuclear physics literature by Wigner in 1955. Now, the reason he was interested in it was because he was looking at experimental results having to do with the energy gaps in the spectrum of, uh, or the scattering behavior of large atoms. You know, atoms that were far too complicated to analytically solve. Now, the behavior of the spectrum of, or the, the, the scattering of large atoms is supposed to be determined by the eigenvalues of their Hamiltonian. Okay, this is from quantum physics. But these are too complicated to understand. So what he said was, let's forget about a complicated object and let's replace it by a random object, which has the correct symmetries of these Hamiltonians. So he introduced this ensemble because it was the simplest thing that had the right behavior, the right symmetries. Now, the question he asked had to do with the behavior of the gaps of the eigenvalues. But there are lots of questions you can ask. So let's call lambda 1 through lambda n the, the random real eigenvalues that are induced by diagonalizing this matrix. Now, one of the fundamental first results is the so-called Wigner semicircle theorem, which says that if you look at the histogram of eigenvalues, it forms a semicircle distribution. It's quite beautiful can be proved rather easily in terms of uh, what's something called the moment method. Now, the way that KPZ behavior rears its head and the way that this first distribution arose is that if you look at the largest eigenvalue of this ensemble, it will behave, this is what Tracy and Whittem proved to get their name on this, it will behave like 2n, so here's 2n, I guess n must be 50, or maybe things have been scaled differently than I am, Anyway, it will behave like 2n plus order n to the 1 third, that's that kpz n to the 1 third, times a random variable which, as n goes to infinity, converges in distribution to this GUE distribution. That's where the GUE comes from. Okay. Now, what in the world is the relation between random matrices and random growth? Well, there's been a lot of work in trying to understand that. It's a little bit complicated. Let me give you one example which gives a little bit of a taste of the relation. And this is actually an example uh, which is much more relevant to big data rather than big atoms. So in, in the study of big data, you're often interested in studying covariance matrices or something called principal component analysis. Essentially, principal component analysis says, given my data, what is the best elliptical fit for that data? I have a cluster of data in a high dimensional space. How can I best capture that with an ellipse? And then what's the longest direction of that ellipse gives you the principal component. And that tells you the direction and the correlation which is most evident in the model. Now, a natural question is that what if the data underlying your system is totally random. Will you still see spurious correlations in the system? In order to have good statistics, you need a benchmark. And that benchmark should be random data. Because if you can't tell the difference from random data, then you can't tell very much. So what is a good model for random data? Here I'll deal with uh, complex data stuff that comes up, say, in communications, um, you have a matrix whose entries are just complex Gaussian, totally IID in every entry. So you can imagine, say, the columns are data samples, and each uh, different column represents a different communication protocol or a different wire, something of this sort. Now, Wishart introduced this ensemble. And he was interested in studying the statistics, the behavior of the eigenvalue, of the, uh, what are called singular values. So um, the singular values are described by looking at the matrix times its complex, trans uh, its, uh, its, uh, complex conjugate. This makes it into a uh, square matrix. And you can diagonalize that. And the square root of the eigenvalues are the singular values. And I'll write them as abusive notation as lambdas. 
So the question becomes, what is the behavior of these singular values? Now, there's lots to be said, but here's a big surprise that didn't come until 2000. Here's my model of random matrices. It's indexed by the size of the matrix, n and m. I have an n by m matrix. I look at the largest singular value of the matrix times its complex transpose. That is equal in distribution to the last passage time on an, m, on an n by m grid, you know, from 1, 1 to n, m in, with exponential weights. Kind of amazing, right? Why in the world is this true? There's a lot to it. Well, one example is n equals m equals 1. This is the second calculation I promised. So in that case, it's very easy to see why this is true. Then you have a 1 by 1 matrix. You just take a complex Gaussian times its transpose. What's the distribution of the square root of that? Well, you put it in. You find, in fact, that by going to radial coordinates, you can integrate out the, uh, the theta. And you get left over after a change of variables with the integral of an exponential distribution, which is the one by one case of last passage percolation. Because there's only one weight there, and it's exponential. Okay. Now, I'll warn you, the general nm result is a little harder to prove. Okay. And I wouldn't approach it in the exact same manner. OK, here's the last thing, and I'll be brief. This is uh, a model for vicious walkers, or random tilings. What you do is you start with four, or in general, n particles equally spaced. And you allow them to take up and down by one steps, with the condition that they don't like each other. And they don't want to touch each other. They actually kill each other if they touch each other. So you just throw out those configurations. So you now ask, if I uniformly sample all configurations that start and end at the same locations after a certain amount of time, what will that look like? What will the typical configuration look like as I take the number and this time to infinity? Well, here's another way of visualizing it. To every up step, I associate a rhombus that points upwards. To every down step, I associate a rhombus that points downward. And to every emptiness, I just put a diamond. And then you see that these paths can actually be thought of as representing level lines of a filling of a corner of a room. Stare at it for a moment, and you'll see that. So you have boxes that are stacked in the corner of a room, and these are the level lines. And the, the filling of the corner is random, uniform. Another way, if you erase these lines and you stare at it again, is that you have a, a hexagon, and you're filling it with three types of rhombuses. And you're uniformly choosing that filling. OK, so these are equivalent mechanisms. Now, the final result I give you is what happens when n and m, or when the size goes to in infinity, or gets very large. So here's a picture of the tiling. I've colored them three different colors. And what you find is that there is there are regions near the edge which are frozen as certain types of colors. So here they're all down pointing, and here they're all up pointing, and here they're all diamonds. And then you have a shape. And the shape is actually an inscribed circle. It touches at six points. And then you can ask, and this is called the Arctic Circle Theorem. It's proved in the late 90s. And then you can ask about the behavior of the top level line fluctuating around that Arctic Circle. And here's the, the final kicker, is that you can prove that if you look at the top curve and you take n to be the size of the system, it will show n to the 1 third fluctuations with the GUE distribution. And in fact, it'll be correlated horizontally, and you guessed it, like n to the 2 third, which is this KPZ 3 to 1 scaling that I've been talking about all along. So there are many different questions, many different pretty pictures you can play with in this context as well. OK, so let me close with some open problems. These are problems for, for you guys to solve. The first problem is to, uh, they're actually in uh, kind of increase or decreasing difficulty. So do everything I did in higher dimensions. 
In particular, study randomly growing surfaces rather than randomly growing curves or interfaces. That's a really hard problem. And there's very little that's understood. But you could imagine a simple model. You start filling the corner of the room with boxes. Everywhere there's a corner, you fill it after a waiting time of rate one. What does that look like? Even the limit shape isn't known. There are some conjectures. The, even the fluctuation scale is only conjectural. It's only numerical. Big question. Really, the big one is universality. Show that I showed you a few special examples in each category. It stands to reason that you should be able to deform away from these special examples. There's nothing that's so you know, unique in nature to corner growth. Nature doesn't care about microscopics. Nature is generally on the macroscopic. So you should see behaviors that don't, don't depend that much on the microscopic. And this you need to prove. So for instance, here's a very concrete model, ballistic deposition. My challenge to you is to prove that ballistic deposition has t to the 1 third fluctuations. Or even to show, compute what the, what the speed of propagation is for that model. Various other models as well. Last passage percolation, replace the exponential random variables with any other distribution and show you have the same type of behavior. Different constants, but the same behavior. Doesn't, we don't know how to do it. There are questions, of, still questions interesting about studying this entire space-time limit, this so-called KPZ fixed point, studying the, what I was describing as weak universality of the KPZ equation and studying new integrable examples. These are all things that are, are of interest, uh, but certainly I'd say that the first two are the most important and the, that we can say the least about at this point. Okay, so let me summarize and say uh, what we've done. So the whole idea of this talk was to illustrate that in order to understand universal phenomena, it is often useful to study integrable examples. Examples which are exactly solvable. I didn't explain to you why they are solvable. That comes from certain algebraic structures that actually produce and give you tools to analyze the models. I'll be discussing that tomorrow for those who are interested, though it will get a little bit technical. Um, now, I illustrated the simplest example, which was coin flipping, and by way of that, the Gaussian universality class. And then I turned to the study of randomly growing interfaces and described to you the phenomena that occurs in those systems, uh, in nature, and also in, in, on the, you know, in mathematical calculations. We saw that, these, that this KPZ universality class arose in a, a whole host of other types of systems, systems for traffic, for optimizing paths, for stochastic PDEs, for random uh, growth and random, or for, for random walks in random environments, big data, and tiling. And they actually arise in other contexts that I haven't had the time to discuss. So there is another notion of a universality class, and there are other statistics beyond that of the Gaussian. We're very far away from universality at this point. It took about 200 years, remember, from when Demov discovered the bell curve to when Lyapunov proved its universality. So my hope is that with the help of the people in this room, it won't take 200 years, maybe 20 years, maybe two years if we're lucky, but hopefully we'll be a little bit faster in our lifetime. So thank you very much. Alors, avant de se quitter, est-ce qu'il y a des questions Merci. You, you used the word um, KPC fixed point uh, several times. Mm -hmm. um, what do these words uh, refer to Yeah, so... <coughs> so the, the KPC fixed point is supposed to be the limit of the space-time growth process. So the entire growth process, 
you scale time and space and fluctuations, and now you see a rescaled growth process. And so the fixed point is supposed to be the fixed point of this rescaling, of this renormalization operation. Now, we don't have a full description of the fixed point, of this limit. So as L goes to infinity of the limit of the space-time process. We know it's one point marginal. We know, in fact, the entire spatial trajectory. We have formulas coming from exact models for now for the two point distribution. So you fix, uh, look at time t and then time s. Or, well, I shouldn't use s. You look at time t1 and time t2, we know the joint distribution. But we don't actually have a description of the entire space time limit. Um, there are some kind of conjectural descriptions in terms of inviscid Berger's equation driven by non Gaussian noise. There's some kind of description there. But um, even that is, is, is a subject of discussion. But the fixed point is supposed to be the universal limit, space time limit, of models under the 3 2 1 limit, under the 3 2 1 scaling. That's the most universal object. In the sticky model, we saw uh, sort of holes appearing. Do we have results, numeric results, about uh, the mean of the, their area, uh, despite the fact that it seems funny? The question is real. Well, um, since the, the levels are correlated, I suppose um, the area should not be uh, very important. So I suppose there's a mean, and it's actually m uh, harder for the area to be great than to be small. So in your in your curve, um, you had a, an asymmetric distribution when it was harder to be on the left and on the right. Or so, so you mean in in this? Picture or in ballistic deposition, or which uh, which one? In ballistic distribution. So. Yes, here. So, so you're asking about kind of the the percent that's empty. Yes, and the the average area of the holes. Oh, the average area. Um, there. There are numerics. There's a lot of numerics about this. Um, of course, it's related to the growth speed, and um, I don't know. I don't know what the kind of average size of these of these gaps, of these empty areas are. You know, there is a little bit of a tree structure that you can see evolving. So here's a a tree. There's some trees that that propagate. Um, but there's a lot that people have numerically investigated, but very little that we can prove. Um, but I can point you to some papers about this. Are there many other uh, university classes? Well, so, so there, yeah, there are. Uh, you know, there are universality classes that deal with systems in equilibrium statistical mechanics. So things like easing model, uh, you can study the behavior of critical um, statistical mechanical models in equilibrium. And these come with all other types of scaling exponents. Um, as far as random growth is concerned, there are also different types of random growth I didn't talk about. So there's what's called quenched noise, where the noise is fixed in space. And as you grow, you encounter the noise. And this changes the behavior as well. So there are ways to go away from this. In a sense, this is the simplest types of uh, non-Gaussian universality classes that um, are fairly well understood. But yeah, there are others. Encore une question Eh bien, merci beaucoup. Thanks a lot.